Again, thank you for joining us this evening. You're now in t- inter- attending the webinar entitled Traveling Black, Race and Resistance on the Road, the Rails, and the Skyways. Our leader for this session is Mia Bay, uh, Roy F. and Jeanette P. Nichols, Chair in American History at the University of Pennsylvania, and also an NHC Fellow, 2009-2010. Uh, we also joined by Eric Foster. Eric is a member of this year's Teacher Advisory Council, who will serve as our TA for tonight's session. Eric will be active in the chat, sharing thoughts and resources, and asking questions. We'll begin. Dr. Mia Bay is the Roy F. and Jeanette P. Nichols, Professor of American History at University of Pennsylvania. She is a scholar of American and African-American intellectual, cultural, and social history, whose recent interests include Black women's thought. African-American approaches to citizenship and the history of race and transportation. She holds a PhD and master's in philosophy from Yale University and a BA from the University of Toronto. Bay is the author of the Bancroft Prize winning Traveling Black, A Story of Race and Resistance, Harvard University Press 2021, which also received a 2022 Prose Award for Excellence in American History, the OAH's Liberty Legacy Award, the Lillian Smith Award, the Order of the Coif Award, and the 2021 David J. Langham Prize in Legal History. May's other books include The White Image and the Black Mind, African-American Ideas About White People, 1830 to 1925, To Tell the Truth Freely, The Life of Ida B. Wells, and the edited work Ida B. Wells, The Light of Truth, The Writings of an Anti-Lynching Crusader, Bay is currently completing a new book on the history of African-American ideas about Thomas Jefferson. And for you all, again, it is indeed an honor to have Mia Bay with us tonight. Without further ado, I present to you all Dr. Mia Bay. Dr. Mia Bay, we are honored to have you with us tonight and look forward to your talk. We will begin. Thank Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you all for attending this evening. Um, I'm looking forward to talking about my most recent work, uh, the study Traveling Black, which explores the intertwined history of travel segregation and black struggles for freedom of movement. Um, It's a book I wrote by following the experiences of generations of African-American travelers as they encountered and resisted segregation and discrimination on stagecoaches, steamships, railways, and in cars, buses, and planes. In all, the book documents a sustained African-American fight for mobility that falls largely outside organizational histories of the civil rights movement um, and explores why the eradication of these forms of discrimination became so central to the African-American freedom struggle. Moving through the book, I will that I will break down what I'm saying into four components so we can have a kind of conversation about it. Um, I want to start out by talking about the origins of the Jim Crow car, the segregated railway car, which is where you first get a sort of legal system of transportation segregation and also becomes a metaphor that really defines segregation. The Jim Crow car becomes what people talk about when they talk about divisions between the races. I want to talk a little bit about why that is and why the Jim Crow car was something that blacks rallied against. Then I want to move on to how the system expanded and spread into other more modern forms of transportation, such as cars and buses, and how it was something that African Americans encountered virtually everywhere they went. Um, Resistance is part of the story throughout my narrative, um, and it's something that I'll zero in on in the third part of this presentation when I talk about how black activists um, eventually managed to challenge Jim Crow in the courts and through direct forms of protest and eventually got rid of the world of Uh, colored cars and back-of-the-bus seating um, and entered 
um, it, which was one of the significant victories of the civil rights movement um, and the product of years and years of struggles, um, but also didn't create a perfect world, which is something I want to get us to, us, us to discuss in the last portion of my presentation, Black Travel Matters, which will discuss the persistence of travel inequities in the present era and what happens after um, momentous events like the Freedom Rides create a formal desegregation that nonetheless does not mean that travel becomes equal across the board. So let me get started with the Jim Crow car. Uh, segregation is almost as old as common carriers such as stagecoaches and steamships, were, which were sort of the first ticketed non-private vehicles people used to travel in the United States. Um, like so many forms of transportation still do today, all of these forms of transportation had sort of a bad seats, um, different, different, different sort of quality of seats, um, and working class people, enslaved people, poor people were often relegated to sitting in the worst seats on early forms of transportation. In the case of the stagecoach, it would be on the outside of the stagecoach. You see the two men in the image riding outside. Um, where you were not sheltered from the elements and could actually occasionally be bumped right off the stagecoach. Um, it then develops along the railroads where you get something called the Jim Crow car, which emerges first in the northern states for the simple reason that the northern states are where the first railroads begin to operate in um, extensive, on extensive lines for the public. This is around the 1830s, um, and the bad seats, which on the stagecoaches are the out, outdoor seats, which is also true on the steamships, outdoor is worse. Um, in the trains, the bad, um, the sort of least favorite form of place to travel was the car that ran directly behind the engine, which was often used for baggage, and it was used to carry equipment and garbage. These cars were typically half price, and once again, accommodated people who could not afford better accommodations. And over time, on routes that served a lot of black passengers in the Northeast, they also um, developed a particular name. They were sometimes called dirt cars or refuse cars, but in the Northeast, on routes where they attracted a lot of black passengers, they were called the Jim Crow car. I'm just going to play the song that goes with the Jim Crow car name. I'm not hearing the audio. Here we go. Here we go. I'm not sure if you guys are hearing this audio particularly well. I am not. Okay, I'm not sure if you heard that, but um, it I I wanted to play it just to discuss briefly how this name, the Jim Crow car, makes its name makes its way from blackface minstrel shows to the railroads, which is not a clear journey. But the name is apt for this um, railroad car. Jim Crow is this wildly popular theatrical ch character created by a white actor, Thomas. Rice, um, who maintained that he modeled his performances, which we saw in the videos, um, on the comical antics of a crippled enslaved stable man, hand. Um, as performed by Rice, regardless of where he got this sort of um, 
routine. Um, the Jim Crow figure above all mocked black aspirations for respectability and prosperity. You see it in the way the Jim Crow figure is dressed. He's not dressed like a plantation field hand. Instead, of he's sort of dressed like a northern dandy who's down on his luck. Um, and the Jim Crow figure emerges in the 1830s, um, 1820s and 30s to sort of mock black aspirations towards respectability at a time when slavery has been abolished in the North, and you do have a rising class of African Americans striving to sort of enjoy the full fruits of freedom. And you also have whites who are very much unnerved by this development. This is part of what lies behind uh, the development of Jim Crow cars, the development of the requirement that blacks travel separately from whites. Um, at this point, segregated transportation is enforced by carriers steamship owners, railroad operators, rather than by law, um, and very much reflects the anxieties of this era, as well as anxieties about the new public spaces that were taking place as a result of urbanization and the transportation revolution that had people riding in forms of transportation that hadn't previously existed. However, the image of blacks as buffoonish figures such as Jim Crow had very little to do with reality. So from very early on, middle class and elite travelers would prove a problem for the railroads. They were often unwilling to sit in the Jim Crow car. They could afford full fare tickets and were unwilling to accept low price seats. Indeed, Frederick Douglass, the famous um, former slave who became a black leader um, routinely refused to move into the Jim Crow car, even though he was sometimes beaten by the conductor and the brakeman as a result. Um, and elite black women, such as Mary Church Terrell, who is pictured here, would prove an even more intractable problem for the railroads. They were especially unwilling to ride in the Jim Crow car and often got away with refusing to do so because many 19th century, on many 19th century carriers, segregation was not just a matter of drawing the color line. Instead, the sort of social divisions that railroads established for how passengers traveled um, involved gender as much as race. Uh, during the early era of railways, um, Railroads typically divided passengers by both class and sex to create privileged enclaves for women. Uh, these were necessary because early railroads were a hard sell for female travelers. The 19th century was a time when most men smoked and women didn't. Um, so there's a smoking car, which you can see on the train, but women didn't necessarily want to travel in it. And that train that is behind the engine and the tender, which carried the fuel for the locomotive, um, is also a very dirty car. Generally, it gets the soot and sometimes the sparks from the engine, which women didn't really want to deal with. Um, and finally, uh, the cars towards the front of the train at a time when cranes actually frequently crashed were more dangerous. So to attract women, to ride trains um, when some of these cars were so unappealing to female passengers and also the idea of sort of a, a sort of public form of transportation was also often unappealing to women travelers. Uh, the railroads created a more kind of domestic space. They created the ladies' car, um, which, was a which was a car that rode towards the back of the train, um, had more comfortable seats, was cleaner, and was set aside for women and their travel companions. The ladies' car was where black women, such as Mary Church Terrell, would try to travel. Um, and would frequently succeed in doing so. Um, and they would do so because 
there wasn't necessarily a very good reason for the railroads to kick black women out of the ladies' cars. And when they did, black women sued and, and frequently won. However, over time, this would actually push the railroads to developing a new system that would, incre would increasingly focus on separating passengers by race. This would happen in the post-Civil War era when these issues of um, separating black passengers by race became ever more important in an era when the South was sort of struggling to reclaim its social order. In the South, after the Civil War, um, whites struggled with the fact that while under slavery, the inferiority of blacks was manifest um, and whites didn't actually feel a need for segregation, whereas afterwards, Southern whites very much wanted to create a separation and establish a sort of system of racial hierarchy. So it is as this develops, especially in the 1880s after Reconstruction is over, that Southern states begin to separate, begin to pass what are called separate car laws, which divide passengers by race rather than gender. Separate car laws replaced the ladies' car system. What formerly was called the smoker uh, becomes the colored car and continues to do things like be a place where you might store luggage um, or carry uh, equipment. Uh, it continues to be at the front of the train, what's known as a forward car. It continues to have uh, inferior accommodations as compared to uh, the ladies' car, but it is now the whites' only car. And I'm sorry, it is, it is now the colored car and the car riding behind it or the cars riding behind it or the whites only cars. Um, these new arrangements are given Supreme Court sanction in 1896 in Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, which people sometimes forget was a railroad case, but it was an unsuccessful challenge to Louisiana's separate car law um, and uh, ruled that, uh, that none of the uh, Reconstruction era amendments uh, prohibited state legislatures from requiring separate public facilities for blacks and whites so long as these facilities were separate but equal. Plessy in the long run would not be the last of the subject because last on this last word on this subject because it actually applies only to inter intrastate railroads. Plessy was over uh, a case in which someone was traveling within Louisiana it did not provide decisive support for segregation on interstate railroads. Uh, but in the short time run, it would be understood as if it did, and it would set up a system of segregated spaces that would quickly move beyond just trains and be applied to everything from schools to cemeteries. By that point, also, um, the Jim Crow car would become something that was firmly understood as inferior, and in practice, it would be inferior. Um, one of the irons, ironies I noticed in my work is that the blossoming of the segregation era um, the late 19th century coincided with the golden age of American railroads, which extended from the late 19th century to the early 1920s. These years saw the railroads handle 98% of all inner city transportation, as well as 77% of inner city freight. They traveled uh, millions of miles and served 85,000 stations. Um, it was a time when everyone traveled by train, um, and many train accommodations were lavish. Um, but many of these enjoyable features of the golden age of the railroads bypassed African Americans. Instead, for blacks, um, often accommodations actually declined over time. As you can see in the picture, there's, there's sort of very lavish accommodations in, in the train that's pictured here, and you see, um, I don't know how well you see it, but you see a, 
black man serving people. And that's fairly typical of the railroads. They began to offer amenities such as dining cars, um, sleeping arrangements, but these facilities were rarely available to blacks. In fact, food was often hard for blacks to purchase even on long trips. Um, dining cars, even in the north, did not admit black diners. And in the south, blacks could rarely purchase food at any point on their journey. Um, by the early 20th century, not just um, trains, but railroad stations were segregated and offered few uh, places where blacks could even purchase something to eat. Um, Refreshments were sold in the big waiting room, which was whites only, and African Americans traveled with shoeboxes full of fried chicken and other things to sustain themselves on their journey. The conditions on the cars were likewise deeply unequal. Plessy had given the railroads license um, to define separate but equal however they chose, and one of the ways that the railroads manage the additional expense of running an extra two, two separate sets of cars is by using the oldest, most broken down trains that they had in their possession as the Jim Crow cars. Jim Crow cars such as the one pictured here uh, were often combination cars that might also accommodate luggage, sometimes white smokers. Uh, they were wood, they were often some generations older than the other cars, um, and um, they were extremely uncomfortable. Passengers on combination cars such as this um, complained that they were sandwiched into a little ap apartment in front surrounded by smokers um, and divided from them only by flimsy compartments. They said that what they were riding in was nothing but an old smoking car. These conditions varied from train to train. It depended on the size of the train. Um, in the pictures you see here, uh, these are from the 1930s uh, from a court case waged by a black litigant um, who they compare two trains at that time. You can see that the colored car is perhaps in better shape than the wooden one we just saw, but the accommodations for white travelers are much more lavish and comfortable. They also have air conditioning, which is lacking in the colored car. Um, and typically, these cars at this point are at this, but are charging the same fare for the different accommodations. When the railroads moved towards the Jim Crow system, they also began to create a one fare system. So one of the many complaints that African Americans had about the Jim Crow car was that you actually had to pay the same fare to travel in what was always a manifestly less comfortable car and was sometimes also an extremely dangerous car. One of the most surprising things I eventually figured out in researching my book um, was I began to realize that there had been a phenomenon um, that was known as the Jim Crow car train crash. Um, the institutionalization of Jim Crow um, took place at a time when railroads were beginning to provide most of their passengers with an increasingly safe and comfortable ride, eliminating things like oil stoves and oil lamps and coal stoves, um, and moving towards all metal railroad cars, which were safer. But these improvements entirely bypassed black travelers who were usually still in the railroad's oldest cars. So what would happen in the event of train crashes, which remained quite frequent in the early 20th century, would be that the Jim Crow car would be the only wooden car on the train. And were the train to crash, it would be sandwiched between the all-metal locomotive um, and other all-metal passenger cars, and it would frequently collapse like an accordion. So as a result, what you saw during the early years of the 20th century are numerous um, Jim Crow crashes in which 
virtually all the deaths and injuries are in the Jim Crow car. Um, one example is pictured here, a wreck of the Hamlet in 1911, head-on collision between a freight train and a passenger train that kills eight people, all of whom are black, um, as are the several dozen passengers who are injured in the crash. Um, and this is likewise true or similar statistics um, occur with the largest train crash in American history, which is the great train wreck of 1918, uh, which kills 121 people, um, over 70% of whom were black. Again, everyone's in the Jim Crow car or cars. There are sometimes some whites in these cars. Railroad f workers frequently travel in them but they are the dangerous place to be on the train. This is something that African Americans are very much aware, aware of. People put complaints in front of the railroad commissions. Um, they lobby to get some sort of change. But nothing is ever done about these Jim Crow car crashes. The last one took place in 1951, which was after that a lot of these trains were finally too old to move, and it was protested by the NAACP, but um, these trains basically aged out rather than ever being removed for safety reasons. So I would like to take a break here, um, play a little music, and then talk a little bit. don't think the music is is playing Can anyone hear it Okay, what I had tried to play for you was Jim Crow Train by Josh White, um, which both evoked the sounds of the train and protested Jim Crow and underscored how the Jim Crow Train just became such a phenomenon for African American travelers. It was something that everyone despised and no one could avoid, um, and African Americans tried um, to do things like challenge the dangers of Jim Crow cars, and I also tried to get the federal government to take action. They, they litigated individual lawsuits against the Jim Crow car, but they could never quite shake it off. Um, questions about this phenomenon? Thank you so much, Dr. Pei. And um, our participants indicated that they could hear. Oh, I'm sorry, then I <laughs> cut it off for no reason. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it's all good. It may be our computer audio uh, settings as well. Um, but a question that we have from John, this question is, did gender separation end when separate equal began? It did more or less. Um, they began, ladies' cars became increasingly uncommon. Some, I think there were probably still some in areas of the Northeast, but under Southern law, uh, what was required by law was, in fact, white and black cars. Um, and there were weird individual exclusions to the gender, even to this. Um, uh, one of the sources I provide for you is Betsy's Borrowed Baby, which describes a, a which is a story that describes a college student that tries to get, uh, that successfully gets out of riding in the colored car by borrowing a white baby. Nurses and nannies were exempted from uh, the these rulings, they could travel with their white charge. Good deal. Thank you for that. Another question that came up was the question of class. 
and whether actually traveling during that time was more so reflective of social status. And so you had more uh, black people who were wealthy or middle class, relatively speaking, traveling at that time. Well, I think um, during the early years of virtually all these forms of transportation, from railroads to stagecoaches, steamships, they're initially for upper class travelers. Um, they're expensive. They're they are the alternative to walking and other things. So yeah, they are definitely more available to um, to black travelers who have some means, um, but. Uh, this is also a big country, so you always have African American travelers who simply need to use some of, some of these forms of transportation. Over time, the railroad becomes something that virtually every class of American uses. So it's a mixed bag. But one of the striking things about travel segregation is it is often the presence of middle and middle class and elite black travelers that is most disturbing to whites. It's the presence of blacks in first class cars and sort of um, expensive accommodations that kind of breaks the notion of traditional racial hierarchies and makes whites anxious. That's, 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 a, that's a very interesting point. Um, we had a webinar recently where several questions came up akin to that, um, the notion of the uh, black uh, upper middle class and maybe the inability to put them in their place or considering that that's a challenge or a front, considering mm -hmm. how socially uh, upwardly mobile those, mm -hmm. uh, those black people were. Um, there's another question we have from John. John says, I taught a lesson on Bessie Smith this week and highlighted that she purchased her own car. Could one argue that Smith's train car purchase was an affront to Jim Crow as well as an expression of power and agency? It was definitely a form of resistance to Jim Crow. As I'll emphasize as we move forward, um, the experience of Jim Crow and travel discrimination pushed African Americans, especially people, entertainers like Bessie Smith or people of means to become early adopters of new forms of transportation. So you have many entertainers um, you, buying cars to avoid Jim Crow as soon as cars actually become a practical form of transportation. And it is an affront to Jim Crow, and sometimes they get a certain amount of resentment from whites because it is a very sort of luxurious purchase during this early time. Okay. And the last question we have for now is from John, and his question is, um, if you were aware, how widely was the Jim Crow character used in print media? It was ubiquitous. Um, there was many songs, many representations. Um, the Jim Crow character transitions also into film and radio. I mean, there's, there's, it's sort of an influence on things from Amos in Andy to Al Jolson, um, but, but yeah, it's very, very common. It's very familiar to people. All right. Good deal. That's uh, all the questions we have for now. All right. Well, let me move to talking to how we move towards cars. Uh, the Bessie Smith question is a great segue. Um, and it underscores that the indignities of traveling Jim Crow does push blacks to be eager adapters of new transportation. Uh, we have people like Bessie Smith. Uh, we also have W.E.B. E. Du Bois, who maintains, and one of the readings included on the webinar's site, um, that there is not in the world a more disgraceful denial of human brotherhood than the Jim Crow car. Uh, du Bois takes a very early interest in cars and begins driving early in the 20th century. Other early car enthusiasts um, include the 1908 World Heavyweight Championship, Jack, championship winner Jack Johnson, uh, who's pictured here, um, a big black man who carried himself with swaggering self-confidence. Um, Jack Johnson loved to drive, um, and just as his mastery of boxing sweet science was a challenge to white masculinity, um, 
so was his love of cars. He was a man who was far too proud and hot-headed to be comfortable traveling Jim Crow. He began buying automobiles as soon as they were available. By 1908, he owned five cars, which he drove everywhere, and his command of cars attracted hostility and harassment, especially from policemen wherever he went. He may have deserved some of this harassment. He frequently received tickets for speeding, reckless driving, obstructing traffic, and other moving violations, um, which discouraged him not at all. He even parked his cars on the sidewalk in Chicago and told a judge once that his constant speeding was done for advertising purposes. But Jack Johnson did not need to be a scofflaw to attract attention as a driver, one of the few black men of his time to even own one car. He was once arrested for driving slowly down Broadway in New York City. Um, His offense was driving a car with Chicago plates. um, Disgusted to be stopped, he said, I go fast, they arrest me, and now it seems like when I go slow, they do the same. Next, someone's going to arrest me for being a brunette in a blonde town. So Johnson is clearly aware that his race is responsible for much of the outrage and anxiety his driving inspired, um, in particular from the police. Um, And this will be one of the many problems that blacks will face over time around driving. Um, and there will be others as well. None of that will discourage African Americans from purchasing cars whenever they can. Even working class African Americans will begin buying cars whenever they can once you get the Model T and other affordable cars. Here's an image that um, illustrates that um, black sharecroppers frequently bought cars, especially during good agricultural years. Most often the cars were used, um, but they were an enormous convenience to rural black southerners um, who could um, use cars to have the freedom to uh, shop beyond, uh, beyond the sort of company store of the planters who who they worked for um, to get some anonymity in a world in which they had to provide deference to white people. Um, But they would never be a complete escape from Jim Crow. The popularity of cars can be seen in the fact that they lent themselves even to things like early resistance to forms of municipal segregation. Um, Here are pictured are jitneys, uh, which were a form of transportation which sprang up around the World War I era. They competed with the streetcars and were especially, they were large cars that would sort of travel along the same route as the streetcar and offer rides for a nickel um, and They were especially popular among African Americans because the streetcars were segregated, whereas jitneys offered blacks some choices. White jitney owners did not necessarily pick up blacks, but during the time period that jitneys were all the rage, you had what were called Jim Crow jitneys, which were jitneys operated by and for blacks, which briefly gave African Americans what felt like the possibility of developing their own transportation systems in which they would not experience discrimination. However, in the long run, jitneys were more or less legislated out of existence by municipalities. Um, They were dangerous. There were issues around insurance. Um, They made municipal transportation difficult to sustain. Um, and they were gradually outlawed. They did, however, form a foundation for the inner city bus lines we still have today. And as such, um, they were sort of the background from by which you get the development of buses and perhaps also the segregation that ultimately emerge on buses. Because what would happen with early inner city bus lines is that much like the jitneys, which had typically carried white or black passengers, early bus lines often only carried white passengers. They sort of developed around this sort of idea that the bus driver would simply choose 
who to carry. Um, this system would not go on indefinitely. Um, it was illegal for any common carrier, any ticketed vehicle, to refuse passengers outright. outright. But as late as the 20s, an expose in the Chicago Defender revealed that some bus lines refused to carry black passengers while others carried only a limited number and that all but one of the inner city bus lines serving Chicago seated black passengers in the back of the bus. Well, why was this? There were complicated reasons why, and they had to do with the new world of automobility that was developing around both buses and cars. Um, one of the reasons why bus companies were reluctant to carry black passengers, even in Chicago, is that black passengers were unwelcome at many of the roadside accommodations that serve black pa passengers. So while the bus companies were compelled by law to sell transportation to all comers, um, some of the Chicago bus lines would warn any black passenger who really managed to, who managed to secure a tr seat that they wouldn't be able to get off the bus at any point during the trip. And this would be, um, in one case, on an 11-hour trip with three or four scheduled stops for r refreshment and comfort. Um, Black drivers p faced equally ubiquitous challenges when it came to um, stopping and consumption. Um, traveling any distance by car requires food, ja food gas, and accommodations, um, and these were not always available. One of the really striking things I found in researching this book is that there were gas stations which would not even sell gas to black drivers, which puzzled me for a long time. Um, and to figure out why that was, I had to kind of look into the history of the gas station, which again got me back to the sort of question of gender and domestic space. Gas stations originate um, as a business developed by oil and gas companies to sell their sort of virtually interchangeable products of oil and gas uh, to customers and develop brand loyalties. And one of the ma major targets of their campaign to sort of capture brand loyalty um, is, is a, an effort to, to target women drivers. Before gas stations, gas was typically bought at hardware stores by men. They were kind of male spaces. Gas stations were developed to make buying gas easy, comfortable, and safe, and to make women drivers feel comfortable in doing so. And, and as a result of this, they emerged as very domestic spaces. Uh, this picture of a gas station shows a sort of cottage-style gas station, which probably it probably does, even though it's somewhat old, it may not even look unusual to, today. This kind of architecture still exists. And these are targeted at women. Petroleum magazines would tell gas station owners to dress your station up with flowers. Um, and gas station owners would also emphasize other domestic virtues, such as very, very clean gas stations um, where women could take their children to the restroom, as pictured here, uh, that were pristine. And what was being marketed in gas stations was this sort of vision of middle class domesticity, which very much centered around white women. And this was one reason why blacks had no place in it. Um, accordingly, um, even when they could buy gas, black passengers often found themselves barred from using bathrooms, lunch counters, soda fountains, and restaurants and roadside service stations. And in the South, um, um, many of these accommodations are segregated by law. Uh, but not only in the South. As far north as um, Illinois, um, a Meyer station near Jol Joliet, Illinois, greeted travelers with a large, we do not cater to colored signs. The landscape of segregated bus transportation can, of course, also be seen in bus stations and accommodations that are developed just for blacks in the south. Again, they're required by law. Um, so you do end up seeing things like the white and colored signs in this image, as well as 
these accommodations set aside for white women um, and colored diners, uh, which became commonplace in the South. Um, as you see in the picture, colored dining in the rear, the accommodations for blacks, when available, are typically um, of a lesser quality than those for whites, um, and sometimes they are not available. Black automobile drivers had more flexibility than bus passengers when it came to finding places to stop, but accommodations were often far and few in, few in between. As late as 1960, reasonable sleeping accommodations for black passengers were an average of 141 miles apart between Washington and Miami and a whopping 174 miles apart between Washington and New Orleans. Moreover, most of the places that admitted black, black travelers were small, so they couldn't be account um, guaranteed to have vacant rooms. Um, traveling black was in a, not just inconvenient, it was dangerous. Um, people often had to drive many miles before they could stop. And as a result, you got black drivers um, filling their cars with food, toilet paper, pecans, maps, all these things to keep from having to stop. It became the way people traveled. As a result, you also got the development of black travel guides, uh, such as uh, the most well-known one, the Green Book, which has been um, become widely known in recent years due to the movie of the same name. Um, one thing to take take note of about the Green Book. It was a far from the only such guide. Um, there were at least a half a dozen of them, probably more like 10. Um, the first one was published in, the, in, the, in 1929. Um, and they all performed a similar function for slightly different target audiences. Um, they located places to stop, places to stay, pl places to buy things. Um, and tried to guide black travelers uh, through the United States with mixed success. Uh, one of the things I found out when I sort of followed up on these guidebooks and how people use them is that they were a very incomplete solution to the uncertainties, uncertainties of traveling black. Um, published yearly or sometimes less often. It was often hard to tell whether the places listed or in some cases advertised were still open. It was also sometimes difficult to tell whether what their quality is. People who used these books reported that they would go to some place and, and uh, that was supposed to be a boarding house and it would turn out to be a whorehouse. So the solution was never entirely satisfying. Um, before the books, people reported they would just love to know what they would encounter when they travel. This continued to be true afterwards. And for this reason, African Americans continued to protest Jim Crow and also began to talk about how it was inescapable, uh, which is something that the blues singer Lead Belly talks about when he sings um, a song, The Jim Crow Blues, which we're going to play now. <laughs> 
So as Lead Belly emphasizes in the talk, everywhere you go, you get some Jim Crow. It was inescapable. It was not limited to the South. Um, and it meant that African-American travelers continued to search for alternatives. Um, flying, which became um, an increasingly common form of civilian transportation during the World War I era, was another um, possible escape from Jim Crow that blacks welcomed. Um, some predicted that Jim Crow would simply end and uh, that the flying would simply squeeze out Jim Crow. Uh, there wouldn't be enough room in the air for black seats. Um, but this would prove disappointing. This image here shows um, a cartoonist in the early 20th century imagining Jim Crow even um, before there is such thing as commercial air. Um, and Jim Crow would quickly catch up with commercial air. Uh, among the surprising findings of my research is that on early, blacks were sometimes excluded altogether from early flights and subsequently various forms of segregating seating developed. Uh, first, blacks were often seated in the the front seat of the plane, which used to be near the propeller and therefore an uncomfortable and somewhat alarming place to sit, um, and subsequently as, train, as planes grew bigger and different in design, uh, African-American travelers, if there were more than one of them, were usually relegated to a separate row of seats. Um, this came out in a court case as well as some letters in which you had airlines admitting that this was a practice uh, that they organized deliberately by assigning special seats to black travelers. Still more common form of segregation on planes was um, the bumping of black passengers, which were who were frequently first in line for any kind of travel disruption. So in flying, as in other forms of transportation, you get uh, people who are entertainers, people who have some money being early adapters, and they have these experiences, even though they are using these kind of lavish forms of transportation. Uh, one case that became well known was Ella Fitzgerald's case, who was bumped off a plane in Honolulu as she was traveling to Australia to give a concert. She and her travel companions got off the plane uh, when it stopped to refuel um, and just were sort of stretching their legs, at, at which point their seats were given to white travelers and the plane left without even allowing them to pick up their handbags and sweaters. Uh, Ella sued. She might have enjoyed being in Honolulu, but she did miss her concert in Australia, and she won. So... Planes would prove disappointing as well. And still more striking would be the fact that airports, which mo many of which are not built until the 1950s, would emerge with segregation. It's not terribly clear in this photograph, but if you look in front of the car rental sign, you'll see a uh, colored waiting room sign. Um, this was a feature of airports. Um, in the South and even in some parts of the Midwest. Um, it's a, it, it, it was done at a time when airports were being built with federal funding, which ought to have prohibited discrimination, um, but um, municipalities found ways around that, such as using uh, non-federal money to do things like build whites only restaurants and other segregated accommodations. Um, and it's a striking development because by the 1950s, you begin to have the courts ruling against segregation on interstate trains and buses um, due to challenges to the law from ordinary citizens. Um, but that does not prevent airports from being segregated. Indeed, airports would not begin to Airports would not be desegregated until the beginning of the 60s when the Kennedy administration finally moved to end the practice by launching a series of uh, lawsuits uh, 
against airports such as Tallahassee Municipal Airport, where these men are standing. Um, the, this airport was built or completed in 1961. It had segregated waiting rooms and restrooms and a whites-only restaurant, uh, which the men in this photograph had tried to desegregate. Uh, they were a group of ministers who had previously participated in one of the Freedom Rides of 1961. And after completing the Freedom Ride, they had traveled um, back to Florida only to find this segregated accommodation in the airport and tried to desegregate it, at which point they were arrested for unwanted assembly um, and had to come back to serve their time in 1964, at which point they were finally released, and we see them pictured here. The story of airports and their desegregation highlights the ways in which traveling for civil rights finally liberates African Americans from many of the forms of discrimination they face. It takes not just the court cases I mentioned, but actual protests such as the Freedom Rides of 1961 um, to actually achieve desegregation, to get bus companies, railroad companies, southern states and municipalities to take down the colored and white signs, to abandon the requirements from segregation. Segregation had taken shape alongside the U.S. travel business and was not easily dislodged. Um, it would take both activism and legal cases and boycotts to finally bring an end to legal segregation. And here I want to take a little break and talk um, about what I've discussed so far before closing with the discussion of modern day transportation and equities. Great. Good, good deal. We have a few questions we want to bring to your attention that will work. Um, a question we have from our good friend Annie Evans. Uh, how might the Harvey House restaurants fit into this narrative? I have read conflicting reports of them hiring and serving people of color alongside white workers. Sorry, which restaurant is it? The Harvey House Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think I at some point actually read a book about them. Um, I think they initially had a kind of ideal server who was a white woman. Um, and all restaurants during the segregation era in the South had to follow Southern law when it came to um, seating segregation. I think worker segregation was perhaps optional, but was also fairly customary. Um, I'm not sure. I guess, I guess I don't entirely know the answer, but from what I remember reading about Harvey, that there was this emphasis on white servers. Good deal. Another question that we have, and I'm pretty sure we know the answer to this, but the Jack Johnson image is so provocative. Uh, mm -hmm. I wonder if entertainers and celebrities who are traveling uh, along maybe the Chitlin circuit um, in areas like this were exempt to a certain degree? Um, not necessarily. There are many stories of people who are, are not exempt, um, and um, blacks who drove fancy cars could frequently attract attention just, just for that. Um, there were, in the early days of driving, reports of people who were beat up or even killed for driving a fancy car. Um, it is true that um, black entertainers such as Jack Johnson and others often sort of defied uh, the sort of racial stereotypes and the sort of sense of what they should do by insisting on driving these fancy cars. Um, but I don't think anyone one was exempt. And, and one thing that other members of the black middle class, especially people who were not, let's say, prize fighters, would sometimes do to avoid harassment is that they would deliberately buy um, sort of more sedate model cars, like things like Fords or as opposed to like fancier brands to avoid white attention. 
Hello? And, and all right. And the question that we have is from Anthony from out of Raleigh. His question is, is uh, where do you, practical question, where do you get, where would you get the Green Book? Who published it and when did publication actually stop? Great question. The Green Book um, started being published in the 30s, if I remember correctly. It was published all the way through to 1966. Um, it was published out of uh, New York City by Victor Green, who was a New Jersey mailman who lived in New York City. He initially started it actually as a guide to places where blacks could stop and stay and eat in New York and New Jersey because, as Lead Billy said, there was some Jim Crow every place. Um, but it eventually expanded to include both national and international spaces. Um, and it was picked up for distribution by ESSO stations in the Northeast, not necessarily in the South, but um, a number of different gas stations um, had interest in trying to help travelers generally find their way and find places to stop. And ESSO in particular targeted black travelers and tried to make the Green Book available. People could also get it by writing to Victor Green's operation in New York City. Good deal. Thank you for responding to those. Um, we're at about mm, 20 minutes remaining right now. So it's about 8.11 now. So we'll go ahead. And if we have time at the end, um, we'll continue on with some additional questions. Okay. I want to begin to wind down by having us think briefly about what happens after the desegregation of trains and buses, which is not a world of complete travel equality. Um, the desegregation of trains and buses comes at a time when tr all forms of travel by bus and rail are declining. Uh, by the 1960s, the United States has become a republic of drivers in which both public and private commitments increasingly center around facilitating travel by automobiles. And pictured here, you see a Chicago suburb, uh, one example of how automobility kind of takes over the United States, especially in the post-World War II era. By the 60s, the use of cars is soaring, and the triumph of car culture reshapes not only local transportation, but long-distance travel transportation as well. The rise of auto, the automobile decimates passenger service on the railroads, forcing dozens of lines out of business today. As most people know, the only commercial lines, um, railroad lines left in business carry freight and passenger rail, um, and passenger rail only survives in the form of Amtrak, a quasi-public transportation, um, quasi-public corporation set up in 1971. Um, of the 366 train routes operating when Amtrak was first established, Amtrak kept only 184 and is now down to 30. The Jim Crow cars of the segregation era are long gone, but so too are most trains. Uh, the same can be said of the nation's inner city buses, which have greatly declined in number since World War II. Greyhound and Trailways were once great rivals, but both nearly went out of business in the 1980s and today only survived by virtue of a merger that allowed them to pair operating costs by eliminating duplicate routes. So we have a world in which segregation signs no longer divide the South trains, buses, trains and buses and travel amenities, um, but there is no guarantee of racial justice. Um, America's increasing dependence on automobiles for transportation has fostered new forms of transportation inequality and new forms of segregation as well. Uh, many black neighborhoods, for example, declined as a result of the construction of the interstate system in the 1960s. Um, the highway often went down and went down in rarely politically powerful black and Latino neighborhoods, um, cutting through and sometimes even getting rid of vital black business districts such as 
Detroit's Black Bottom, Miami's Overtown, Milwaukee's Bronzeville, and so forth. Um, they imposed structural impediments on black mobility that extended outside black neighborhoods. Black car ownership has risen along with all forms of car ownership during this time period, but transportation inequality is also seen in the fact that African Americans and Latinos are uh, significantly less likely to have access or ownership to cars than whites. Um, as of 2015, just 20% of blacks as compared to uh, um, just under 20% of blacks as compared to only 6.5% of whites live in households with no cars. Um, and the cars that many households have are often relatively ephemeral. I'm sorry, I went a little too far. Um, all of this is, is sort of deeply meaningful in moments such as um, natural disasters. In particular, I'm thinking of Hurricane Katrina, which took place around the time I was starting on this book um, and, and um, produced images of stranded pass and stranded people who were overwhelmingly people of color, overwhelmingly black in ways that illustrated the modern day transportation inequities. Of the 2,700,000 people stranded in New Orleans when the hurricane hit, 93% of were black and 55% had no car or any other way to evacuate. Um, what was striking is that New Orleans as a city didn't even have a plan to accommodate anyone without a car. They rerouted the highway system to allow people to leave, but had no real plan other than to tell people who didn't have cars to find a friend who had a car, uh, which in the nature of things it often is does not really work. People who don't have cars often know other people who don't have cars. And then as a final um troubling phenomenon of modern day transportation inequality we have in course of course the traffic stops that haunt our world these days these are actually these both reflect that um, traveling by car has always attracted legal scrutiny for blacks but also reflect the fact that the uh, war on drugs be begun in the 80s has disproportionately targeted black and Hispanic drivers. Um, it was during this time period you began to have police using um, pretextual searches, searches in which you start stop a car for a traffic violation to look for drugs and uh, the techniques they used uh, were designed to target um, minority drivers who the police thought were more likely to be carrying drugs. Uh, these practices still persist today and have become one site of modern day transportation inequity, um, as well as the dangers that have been recently featured in movements like Black Lives Matter, uh, which took shape at least in part around protests having to do with traffic stops and the often lethal consequences that ensue from these encounters between African Americans and the police. So I want to stop there on this kind of sober note and take questions. Okay. Good deal. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question from John. His question is, I was surprised to learn that the California Black Motorcycle Club, the East Bay Dragons, could only buy used motorcycles and parts because California dealers refused to sell to them. How did other black motorcycle clubs contend with the tail end of Jim Crow laws and sentiments? I, that's interesting. And I don't, I don't know that I knew that about motorcycle drivers, but there, um, um, there have been various things around consumption where dealers of various um, you know, luxury vehicles have actually discouraged blacks from buying their vehicles. Uh, it took uh, car companies many years to start even advertising to African Americans. Um, they didn't necessarily want brand their brand associated with blacks. Um, so there is a kind of discrimination in consumption and branding that exists around transportation as well. Great question. Mm 
Thank you for responding to that one. That was actually another question um, regarding where did the automakers and car dealers stand? Were they in it for the money or were they also discouraging black people from participating in highway travel? So thank you for responding. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, there was another question we have, which is, could you speak to how car ownership and the lack thereof is intrinsically linked to voter suppression to this day, ID requirements and gerrymandering issues? Wow, that's really interesting. Um, <laughs> Certainly, it, it facilitates voter suppression. I mean, one of the ways in which, I mean, one of the whole pretexts for voter ID laws is that it makes people without a driver's license less likely to be able to, to be registered to vote, to be able to vote. And in um, adopting such measures, the target has always been for um to target African Americans, Latinos, people of color, and quite successfully. Uh, I'm not sure which which comes first, but um, it certainly facilitates voter suppression. Um, and with, I mean, the political inequities also help sustain the system. The fact that we spend so much of our transportation budget, the public monies that are collected on highways, um, car, forms of car transportation really kind of steals money from the taxpayers who um, are not are not re who do not really take advantage of it. Um, and, and in states where there is literally no budget for public transportation, um, these kind of voters are being fleeced. So it's a sort of seamless system that that um, exploits people. Yeah, the next question is essentially an extension of that, which is what are cities doing around the country to address inequities around access to public transportation? I'm not sure. I mean, I think it varies from state to state. Um, there are cities that have no real commitment to public transportation to this day. Um, there are other cities that are interested in it for reasons that actually go beyond travel inequity. Um, public transportation, as we look forward, will be sort of key to climate sustainability. Uh, car culture, even even if we use electrical electric vehicles, is in not an in, is not an efficient way of carrying large numbers of people around. Um, so that cities that are trying to develop more sustainable models of urban living. Um, are increasingly trying to emphasize public transportation, but it can be an uphill battle in this country where many Americans do not sort of favor public transportation if they can possibly afford alternatives. Mm. And the next question is from Hope, and it's an extension of uh, your uh, look at New Orleans, but does New Orleans now have an equitable plan after the debacle from Katrina? It took a number of years. A couple of years afterwards, they still weren't saying anything about what to do if you didn't have a car, but they now do have a plan. I think it involves doing something they failed to do in Katrina, which is like make use of the existing public transportation resources or, 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 or from Amtrak trains to school buses um, to actually provide some uh, routes out of the city to those who don't own private cars. Mm -hmm. um, Wendy Harris had a comment that says, poor areas get buses, rich areas get light rail. That's true, <laughs> very much so. <laughs> yeah, um, we had a question which came up and um, I'm scrolling here to get to it, hold on. Uh, it was from Akil, and this question was a, a pretty broad question, but why do you think that this type of discrimination still exists today? Well, it's interesting. You know, I, I think when you think about it, travel is like where you see class most obviously in many ways in America today. Like think of traveling by airplane. You can tell almost to the dollar figure who how much people paid for their ticket. You know, like are you in priority one priority one boarding? Are you in first class? Are you in the very back of the plane? Um, so travel is um, a very sort of classed thing um, and one in which 
people are kind of committed to their class commitments as well as how much they paid. Um, I, I think it is something where we see real divisions among Americans by wealth, and, and we see them in, in their sort of full glory. You can travel by private jet or you can uh, be a pedestrian, and there's everything in between that. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question we have is from Sophia. Uh, her question is, as you were researching, what aspects of black travel were you surprised to find were vastly understudied? Vastly understudied. Um, there were a whole bunch. Uh, the Jim Crow uh, train crashes kind of blew my mind. It took me a long time to even figure out why black journalists were routinely enumerating how many people died in train crashes and what race they were. So that was one. Another one was that I found out during the early days of automobile driving in the Deep South, there was some idea that instead of um, the rules of the road functioning as they do today, they would function by race. So at, you know, at a stop sign, <laughs> the white person would get to go first. Um, this did not work out in the long run. Um, you had four-way stops. You had the problem of the black driver detaining the white driver, but there was an experiment with racial rules of the road. Um, and there were some informal ones that did persist, like black drivers were not supposed to pass uh, whites on dusty roads. So those those were a couple that really surprised me. All right, well, thank you so much. I believe we are almost out of time here. And so we are going to plan to close on out. I mean, we're truly thankful and appreciative to you uh, for joining and leading us as well as sharing your expertise with us all. We truly enjoyed this experience. Uh, your overview of the African-American experience on planes, trains, automobiles, and other forms of transportation, and just the spectrum from antebellum era to present day. And so we're gonna go ahead and close out here. Dr. Bay, if you will mute for me, if you will. Uh, thank you all for spending your evening with us. A special thanks to Eric Foster for your service on the Teacher Advisory Council as well as your presence and contributions to the chat. I'd encourage you all to keep up with what's happening at the National Humanities Center through our various social media feeds to get updates on our activities. I'd also like to invite you to check out our next webinar, The Bill of Rights in the 20th Century and Beyond, February 28, 2023, 7 to 8.30 p.m. with Sarah Mayo, uh, Associate Press Professor of Law and History at Vanderbilt Law School. Again, we are truly pre appreciative of you all for joining us tonight. And as I've said, in times past, we value you. We appreciate the hard work that you are doing in your classrooms. And uh, if we could ever be of service to you all, please do not hesitate to reach out uh, to us, um, as I frequently say, to surround and to support you. Uh, tomorrow is uh, is Friday, so I hope you all have a uh, restful and restorative weekend, and I look forward to having you join us again uh, next week, um, same time, and we look forward to hanging out with you and talk with you again. Bye.